Our New Testament reading, our second scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke, and we're in chapter 21, and I'll be reading verses 5 through 19. We've been working our way through Luke and coming upon these interesting sayings of Jesus in parables. We've had a good introduction to uh, what we're going to hear. So now reading from Luke 21, uh, beginning with the fifth verse here, the Word of God. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, he said, As for these things that you see, The days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and plagues, and there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. This is the word of the Lord. It was almost exactly one year ago today when we had a snowstorm. Some of you may remember this mid-November snow of last year. Um, It started in the afternoon, and it was a rather uh, slippery, wet snow. And it started to accumulate right at about the time of afternoon rush hour. And that created some problems. First of all, Streets and roads were very slippery. I believe some municipalities weren't quite ready for snow removal yet, but those that were tried to get their equipment out, and because of the traffic, they couldn't get through and start clearing the streets and roads. And so it became a huge gridlock around our area. I remember hearing stories about commute times in order to get home. Now, I have to say, my commute was a little more than doubled on that day, and it, it probably took about 11 or 12 minutes for me to, to ma- it was slippery uh, for me to, and the hill I had, I got to go down it, people were stuck trying to come up. Uh, but I know some of our, our staff members and some sitting here had six hour, seven, eight hour commutes on that day. And we wondered, how did we get caught so off guard? How did we not know this was going to happen? We, we like to be able to know the future, to plan our lives, to have a sense that we're in control. It's interesting that at this time of year, as we're looking forward to another winter we start hearing about the Farmer's Almanac. I'm sure people have heard of the Farmer's Almanac. I don't know if anybody actually has one or refers to one. You know, I understand there's two versions. There's the Old Farmer's Almanac, and then there's the Farmer's Almanac. Um, There's a third version that goes back to the late 1700s, uh, another Old Farmer's Almanac. And this almanac would 
start to predict the weather as well as give some other predictions, but mainly it was about the weather and people were very interested and fascinated by the possibility of predicting, by the possibility of knowing what's going to be coming at us in the future. And so it did very well in, in circulation. Um, the current version of the Farmer's Almanac comes from the late 1800s. It's been in existence consecutively since then. I, I did just a little bit of research, so I, I do not have a vast knowledge on you know, how do they come up with these predictions. And, and here's what I did discover, though. They supposedly have a secret formula that they use, a way to predict the weather, and apparently it has something to do with the sun and the activity on the sun, but this is locked up and only a few people know about it, and that's the best I can do for you uh, today. We, we have this need. We, we want to know. We want to be able to predict. Um, we want to know what's coming at us. But it seems like life just keeps swirling around like, like a storm in a way. Margaret Wheatley is an organizational writer. She's written some incredible works about how organizations work. Some of you may be aware of Margaret Wheatley, and she's written one long article uh, that's fascinating called Chaos and Complexity. Chaos and Complexity. And Margaret Wheatley is known for her work with the chaos theory. And partly what Margaret, Margaret Wheatley has to say is we are locked in a way of looking at our lives um, we're, we're locked in a way that comes from the beginning of the scientific age. Galileo and the work of Sir Isaac Newton, you know, going all that far back, we, we began to understand life in a more scientific way that we could get the parts figured out and that the parts would come together and it would unfold in more or less a linear manner. And so we've been locked in that way of looking at our world and understanding life for centuries, and we want it to work that way. We want our lives to have this direction and order and way that they unfold. We look for the resources to predict what's going to happen, and we become very undone when it doesn't happen that way. When we're stuck in gridlock and gridlock in life, we become very uneasy. Why didn't I know this? Why didn't somebody tell me? Why couldn't we predict this? And Margaret Wheatley makes the point that life is more circular in nature. It, it, it cycles through. It's, it's not really unfolding in a linear manner. It is more, well, it is more like a whirlwind and, and storm that whirls around. I believe it was 2013, and we were just beginning some of our capital projects here in the life of the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. And the chair of our finance committee uh, gave a moment for a mission, uh, Walt Fleischer. And he began by making a statement, why are we trying to do what we're going to do in this time? And he, he read a general description of our time, we thought. He read this description about, you know, overview of what's happened domestically and what's happening internationally. And, and he went on and on. And then at the end he said, well, actually, that was written in the late 1800s at the time they were going to first build this building. We, we thought he was talking about the current day. It's, it's circular more than, than linear, our lives, how they how they unfold, and we try to continue to force it into one way to look at it, and, and it keeps swirling around in, in a different manner. It, it's circuitous. It comes, it comes back around to us, and, and that continues to 
bring us a disorientation. The, the disciples heard Jesus make a comment about the temple, and so they wanted to know. Now, they lived in a very different time, a different worldview, but they said to Jesus, hey, can you help us? Can you help us know what's coming? Can you help us predict? Can we get into a linear mindset for just a little while? And what Jesus does in this passage is he, he unlocks the formula. You know, the farmer's almanac, they have this formula tucked away somewhere that helps them predict. Well, Jesus, Jesus unlocks the formula, a life formula. And, and he shares the basics of it in this passage. You, you might have missed them. They went by pretty quickly. But they help us understand and look at our lives in a very different way. Because he first said, you know what, don't, don't be terrified. Don't be anxious. Don't be unsettled, overwrought with anxiety. See, when you live in that kind of a way, it constricts your ability to see what is around you. When you let anxiety take you over, you can't see the whole picture. And Jesus begins by saying, don't be terrified. Don't let anxiety rule your life because you're going to miss what is truly unfolding. And, and then he comes to this powerful center section. And he says, you know, you're going to be challenged and, and don't think there's a formula you have to have figured out in order to respond when you're challenged in your life. And more or less what he is telling us is what we hear from spiritual directors over and over again. It's not about a formula. It's about placing yourself in the presence of God and allowing God to work and transform your life, just as you're doing when you come to a worship service. You place yourself in the presence of God. It's not going to be the same for everybody. There's not a set formula we can give you. But when you place yourselves in the presence of God, God can work in your life and transform your life. And that's what Jesus says. It's not going to be the set formula, but if you place yourself there, you'll know what it is you need to do and say. And, and then he comes to this powerful conclusion, third part of the life almanac formula. He says, you need to persevere. You need to persevere. We heard a beautiful story of that uh, that Sarah shared with our children. You, you need to persevere. But see, you now persevere with the understanding of being in the presence of God. And persevering can be a challenge. It's, it's so powerful at the end of this chapter because we say, well, what we always will have left is my family, but sometimes we know that's not true. You know, we, we commit people to God's care. People pass. We, we have broken relationships. And, and sometimes what we thought would always be there may not be there. And Jesus uses that very stark example to say you need to persevere. And not a hair on your head will, will be harmed. See, if you, if you can tap down the anxiety, if you can place yourself in the presence of the living God and allow that transformation to take place, you will be able to persevere with a sense of security and strength within your life. It, it does whirl around us, doesn't it? It it is this circular experience. We, we, we wish it could be linear and we wish we could know what was coming, but it just comes back around so often. Uh, but it's the, the presence of the living God and being present with God in our lives. That's what we look forward to. Next Sunday, we celebrate uh, Christ the King Sunday, our Thanksgiving festival. Then we go into Advent, and we're going to be focusing on what that, what does that kind of a kingdom look like? The presence of the living God. How is that so different from the way we have tended to look at life? You know, what does it mean? What does it mean to unfold this formula of the life almanac? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.